A visitor to Cambodia may find themselves wandering through the tropical forests to visit spectacular ruins of a bygone era. In some places, these ruins are overgrown with trees as the jungle has steadily swallowed them up over the course of centuries. Among these trees are a number of especially fantastical forms creeping sinuously over the ancient stones. The spreading roots almost seem more like tentacle than tree, leaving impressions ranging from strange beauty to subtle malice. Some refer to such trees as banyans or banyan trees. Others call them by a more sinister name, the strangler figs. As this name suggests, these unusual plants are known to slowly strangle other trees to death over the course of decades, if not centuries. They are insidious and patient parasites that eventually usurp and replace their hosts. But there is far more to these trees than their somewhat malevolent reputations. The strangler figs have many aspects, many associations, many faces. Living things tend to be shaped by their environments. Granted, they can also shape their environments in turn. Both of these things may truly be said of strangler figs. So let us first consider just what sort of environment might turn a tree into a killer. In tropical rainforests, the trees grow quite tall, with branches that extend to capture every bit of sunlight that they are able to. This leaves the ground below quite dark and surprisingly open in many places. What plant life there is in this twilight realm tends to be specialized for making the most of very little available sunlight. Whenever a tree eventually falls to old age and the elements, there is a bright gap in this shadowed world. Immediately, plants begin to grow at a remarkable pace to fill this gap each striving to be the one to eventually overtop and outcompete the others. The losers in this contest are eventually left in the shade, most often for a slow death by starvation, at least after the manner of plants. There are certain plant species that take the forms of climbing vines, using the support of the surrounding trees to reach up into the sunlit realms of the forest canopy. There are other species that take on an epiphytic existence, growing on the branches of the larger trees and never making contact with the ground below. These epiphytes live a somewhat rarefied life. Their only water source is rainwater and fog, and the only soil they have access to is whatever decaying organic matter accumulates on the branches. With a sufficient quantity of epiphytes, this can be quite a fair amount, but it is still, at best, a thin layer of nutrients, and not much of a place to anchor roots in. Thus, the epiphytes tend to be quite limited in size, at least compared to the trees they live on. This is the world of the strangler figs, as they begin their lives as epiphytes on the high branches of the forest titans. How does such a plant find its way there, one might ask? In the case of the figs, at least, the seeds were left there by animals. It might have been a large fruit bat, spitting out the seeds and rind of a fig after extracting its juices and softer tissues. Perhaps the seed was left by a passing bird, after passing through the bird, to be delivered with a small helping of organic fertilizer. Whatever the details might be, every so often a seed lands in a favorable spot among the branches. The natural stickiness of these particular seeds helps them to remain in place giving time enough to germinate and send out the beginnings of a root system. The roots grow slowly downward, helping to fix the young plant in place as they spread out over the bark of the host tree. There is sunlight enough in this high place for the diminutive fig plant, as its leafy branches extend outward into the canopy. Decades may pass as the little plant slowly grows, limited by the scant mineral nutrients available from the thin layer of soil it has sprouted in. All the while, its roots move steadily downward over its host tree, getting steadily closer to the ground far below. In time, if the fig survives, 
a root at last makes contact with the soil. From this point, things change considerably. The plant now has access to groundwater, which is a far more reliable and stable source of moisture than rainwater. Though the soil in rainforests isn't especially rich in nutrients, it is still better than what little may be found clinging to the tree branches. Beyond this, the roots can now securely anchor themselves into the earth and spread out underground. With all of these resources now available, the formerly slow growth of the strangler fig becomes relatively rapid. The roots multiply and expand, fusing into one another to form a labyrinthine mesh about the host tree. The strangling process has begun. Up above, the branches of the fig grow upward and outward beyond those of its host tree, steadily cutting off its access to the vital sunlight. As the root system thickens about the trunk, the confined tree has little room left to grow. Below the ground, the roots of the strangler fig compete for available water and minerals, slowly cutting off the host plant's supply here as well. Eventually, perhaps after a century of life, the strangler fig has killed its host tree. Within the confines of its living cage, the dead tree rots away. Even this is a boon for the fig, as it readily absorbs the nutrients released by the rapid decomposition. In the end, all that remains of the original tree is an outline, a hollow space within the labyrinthine trunk of the strangler fig. Just a memory. Ghoulish though it might be, this hollow trunk provides a habitat for a great many creatures. Such trees, sometimes known as columnar trees, are quite important to various species as homes and refuges. In some species, the tree eventually grows beyond this single trunk, spreading outward in a most unusual manner. This can be seen in Ficus bengalensis, commonly called the banyan, the banyan fig, or the Indian banyan. Perhaps not surprisingly, this species is found growing in the tropical forests of India. The banyan's branches tend to grow outward in a rather broad pattern. Beyond a certain distance from the trunk, these branches sprout additional roots that extend downward, hanging from the branches at first. When they reach the soil, they thicken and expand with time to form additional supportive trunks. Eventually, a single tree may grow outward to cover several acres, becoming very much a habitat in its own right. This habitat formation is only a part of the strangler fig's importance in rainforest ecosystems, however. Strangler fig trees tend to bear fruit throughout the year, including the dry season when most other trees are lacking in such food sources. Many species rely upon the fig trees during the leanest parts of the year, and would be unable to survive without their presence. Indeed, there are a number of creatures that subsist almost exclusively upon a diet of figs. The most extreme case of this dependence is found in a group of insects with lives intimately tied to the strangler figs. Fig wasps encompass a variety of species, generally within the family Agaeonidae. Some of these species are parasitic, but others are mutualists with the figs. To properly understand this mutualism, we must understand a little more about the structure of the fig itself. One might regard a fig as a fruit, but technically the matter is a little more complicated. What we regard as a fruit is more of a hollow, fleshy stem with an interior chamber lined with tiny flowers. This structure is technically known as a syconium. At the end of this odd structure is a small opening, the osteole. A number of obstructing bracts line this osteole, greatly limiting access from the outside. One creature that is able to pass through this narrow path is the female fig wasp. Such wasps find their way to the immature, unripe figs, generally guided by chemical cues. The creatures are tiny, with strangely elongated heads that most often bear backward-pointing spines on their undersides. Such spines aid the wasp in pressing forward through the osteole and into the syconium's internal chamber. Even then, it is a tight fit, and the wasps tend to forfeit their wings and parts of their antennae as they struggle through. Once inside, the wasps move among the minuscule flowers in search of suitable places to lay their eggs. The flowers are generally of three types, 
There are the male flowers, which are not yet mature at this point, and two types of female flowers. Among the female flowers, there are those with long styles and those with short styles. In some fig species, both of these types are found in the same syconium. In other species, they tend to be only one type or the other. This distinction is quite important to the female wasp, as her ovipositor is only long enough to reach the female flowers with the short styles. Those with long styles are beyond her reach, and a wasp that finds herself in a fig with only this sort of flower will never successfully reproduce. The same could not be said of the fig, however. The fig wasps have brought something along with them, which they obtained where they were born. They are covered in pollen from the male flowers of the fig they hatched in. In their search for suitable egg-laying sites, they spread this pollen onto the female flowers and effectively fertilize them. If a fig has female flowers with short styles, these particular flowers will not develop seeds. Instead, due to the actions of the wasp, what might have become a seed is eaten away and effectively replaced by a wasp larva. In figs with only short-styled female flowers, no seeds at all are produced. This is a worthwhile sacrifice on the part of the fig tree, though, as it allows the next generation of fig wasps to be born to pollinate the next generation of fig trees. Regardless of personal success or failure, the wasps that entered the fig eventually die. Some time later, after the fig has grown and ripened to a degree, the larval wasps pupate and eventually hatch out into adults. This happens in two stages, however. The first adults to hatch are the males. These creatures are difficult to recognize as wasps, as they are wingless little creatures. What they lack in wings, they make up for in mandibles. That and initiative. These males seek out the female fig wasps and effectively mate with them while they are still in their pupil stage. Then they put their jaws to work, chewing their way out of the fig. Sometimes they widen the osteole, and sometimes they simply bore right through the outer wall. With that work done, they eventually perish, never venturing beyond the home they hatched in. Meanwhile, the females hatch out and find themselves in a world of pollen. The male flowers have matured by this time, and the fig wasps cannot avoid a rather extensive covering of pollen grains as they clamber about in search of an exit. They have no need to find a mate, as the males have already taken care of that particular issue. They have no need to make an exit either, as the males took care of that as well. Thus, the female wasps crawl out through whatever tunnels have been previously excavated, and fly off to find an unripe fig to enter into. One might wonder what becomes of the corpses of the male fig wasps, and the remains of the female wasps that entered this particular fig in the first place. Connoisseurs will be relieved, or perhaps a bit disturbed, to know that the fig in fact digests these remnants with a series of proteolytic enzymes. After all, these tiny insects are a good source of nitrogen and minerals. As such, there is a definite advantage in consuming their corpses to help fund the development of the final fruit. While the strangler fig might be a parasite that kills its host tree, it is also many other things to other species. It is a habitat to a great many local creatures with its labyrinth of fused roots that serves as a hollow trunk. It is a vital food source to a great many frugivores in the rainforest. It is a mutualist with the fig wasps, and the association is so intimate that each species of strangler fig has its own dedicated species of pollinating fig wasp. All of this is impressive enough in its own right, but there is also the matter of the fig's human associations. For this, let us consider a few individual species within the genus. Figs in general are all within the genus Ficus, and strangler figs tend to be confined to the subgenus Eurostigma. The Indian banyan, Ficus bengalensis, has already been mentioned, and it should be added that this particular species is regarded as the national tree of India. Many consider this tree to be sacred, and larger specimens are often found in proximity to temples. A decidedly more modest species is Ficus carica, the common fig. This is not a strangler fig, but it is worth mentioning as it is the species that has been cultivated by humans most extensively as a food source. 
Found all over the Mediterranean region, the common fig tends to grow as something between a large shrub and a small tree. Regardless of its humble stature, it has been cultivated by humans for millennia, and is among the oldest of crops to be found in historical records. Incidentally, the wasp that pollinates this particular species of fig is the species Blastophaga senes. Along with Ficus sycamorus, the sycamore fig, the common fig has been an important food source in the Mediterranean for thousands of years. To return to the strangler figs, there is a species found in Central and South America known as Ficus insipida. This species is also utilized by humans, but not for its fruit. Instead, its sap is collected. As with other figs, the sap is rather milky in color and tends to harden into latex. Natural rubber is collected from other trees that are not figs, but the latex of Ficus insipida does have a use all its own. It is collected as a medicine, specifically an antihelmintic. In other words, it is a remedy to remove parasitic worms from the digestive tract. This is accomplished by the proteolytic enzymes found in fig tissues, the same enzymes that are used to digest deceased fig wasps in ripening figs, in fact. In the case of Ficus insipida, one of the enzymes in particular has been extracted and purified, and is commonly known as Ficane. This enzyme is used in a wide range of medical and industrial processes, whether as a meat tenderizing agent, or a cleansing agent for medical sutures, or a component in various serological analyses. Another species, Ficus benjamina, isn't known for its fruits or its enzymes. Rather, it is known as a relatively common houseplant. If you have ever visited a doctor's office and saw a small tree growing in a pot in the waiting room, there is a fair chance it was either Ficus benjamina or a somewhat convincing replica of cloth and plastic. Alas, this particular plant does have the unfortunate tendency to provoke rather strong allergic reactions in some sensitive individuals, thus it has become somewhat less common in the home and office in more recent years. Returning to the outdoors, let us consider one last species of particular interest. Ficus elastica, commonly called the rubber fig, grows in forests in the northeastern part of India, including the state of Meghalaya. In this region, certain individuals among the local Khasi tribe carry out a traditional process that takes full advantage of the plasticity of the strangler fig's growth patterns. There are a number of rivers and streams that crisscross this area, as it is one of the wettest regions in India. Many of these rivers are at the bottom of rather steep gorges, Bridges are required for people to cross such chasms, but there is a slight problem. Being a warm and wet climate, wooden bridges would rapidly decay. Stone bridges are often not practical to build, at least without relying upon considerable numbers of people, and technology that is difficult to transport in remote rainforests. So the human residents have developed a rather singular and elegant solution. They weave and guide the younger, more flexible roots of the rubber fig trees over several years, decades, and even across generations, to form living bridges across the chasms. Of course, such living constructs must be continually maintained and occasionally pruned, but they are quite impressive when fully grown. In the end, the strangler figs are impossible to place within just a single category. They are at once parasites and mutualists, killers and givers of life, malicious epiphytes and giant trees, stranglers and refuges. Their human associations are no less varied than their interactions with the rest of their world. Indeed, the labyrinthine roots seem to be almost a perfect metaphor for the many intricate connections these trees have established. Far more than a mere monster, often rising to a strange sort of magnificence. Each strangler fig is a tree of many aspects and a plant of many faces. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. 
If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.